I'm about to give you a free two hour tutorial on the operation of the Pioneer DJ DDJ Flex 10 DJ controller. This is an exceptional controller. It builds on the success of the DDJ 1000 before it, but now it unlocks both Recordbox and Serato, and it adds new features like control for stems, mix automation, and lighting. It's a great all round controller. Now, if you're coming to this from another Pioneer model or another brand of hardware or another type of system, do check out our table of contents on YouTube. You can hit Control Command F, and depending on your computer, type in the keyword. If we've got a chapter marker for it, it will be highlighted. Hit the time code and it will jump to that part of the video. This is designed to be a video manual, so feel free to come back as often as you like. Now, if you're a beginner or an intermediate DJ, just a quick word of warning, this video alone is not enough to get you playing great DJ skills. There are loads of skill sets that you need to crush it as a DJ. So I can teach you about this piece of gear, but if you don't know about the rest of the gear that you need to use or how to find and organize your music or the basics of counting and timing and beat mixing, or the skills of programming or performing a DJ set, or how to get booked to play those sets, then of course you're gonna be frustrated. When I got started back in 92, we didn't have YouTube. We had to learn by trial and error. I learned how to DJ on cheap belt drive turntables and a crappy Gemini mixer. It took me years of frustration before I got good, and I remember nearly giving up several times. Of course, I'm glad I didn't. DJing has become my career, it's brought me decades of joy. So I wanna make you that promise. Yes, you're gonna get frustrated, but my job as your teacher is to get you through it. You see, too many people who want to learn this spend months or years practicing all the wrong stuff or worrying that the gear is so complicated that they'll never get it. Yes, there is a lot involved, but DJing can be easier than ever if you practice the right things. That's why we've got a crash course on all of this. It's called the Complete DJ Course. It's where I teach you how to DJ on modern gear fast. Even better, it works not only with the Flex 10, but with all DJ gear. Once you've followed it, you'll be able to play confidently on anything. It's about 80 lessons, and you get access to me as your tutor, which makes it a phenomenal investment in your DJing. So if you're interested in that, I'll put a link to the course underneath so you can check out the info page. And if you didn't know, we're also the people behind the Amazon best-selling book on DJing, Rock the Dance Floor, which has helped tens of thousands of people to get started. Again, there's a link underneath, so I'll also tell you how you can get a free copy of this book as well if you hang on to the end of the video. So here it is, we're gonna look at every single knob and function and feature and control on here to start this video. Then we're gonna go directly to Serato and Recordbox, starting with Recordbox because it is the primary software for the Flex 10, but also looking at Serato to show you how these controls work with your software. And we're also going to look at how you can attach extra things to the unit to expand its functionality. That's all coming up. However, to start with, just wanna make sure you've got a couple of things. So I'm assuming you've chosen a software platform. If you're not sure, just use Recordbox. Use the quick start guide info that came with your unit to download and install Recordbox. If you wanna use Serato, do the same thing with Serato. Make sure you use the pitch and time little coupon that came in your box which adds a essential extra to Serato. Just trust me on that. Make sure you install that as well. But there is something that you might not have done now or you might not have checked, which I just want to go through before we move on to our tour of the unit and everything that's going on at the back and all the inputs and outputs and how to use it with Recordbox and Serato, et cetera, et cetera. And that is something that a lot of people sometimes miss and then they're scratching their heads wondering why it's not working how they think it will be. And namely, this is firmware and driver updates. So to figure out whether you need these, head over to the DDJ Flex 10 page here and look at the firmware and driver resources down here. Now you can find this page on the support section of the company website and you can just dial into Flex 10 here. You can see this is where I found it. So there's two things here. There is the firmware update, which is actually sending the latest embedded software to your unit itself, ensuring that it works smoothly. But the drivers are absolutely essential as well, and you're gonna to need to make sure you've got the drivers installed on your computer. If you're using a Windows computer, it will also install a small utility that helps you with various settings. If you're using Mac, it's actually very simple what it installs here. Either way, click in there, download the one for you, install it as you would any app on your computer, and follow the instructions that come with it. Once you've done that, you can be sure you're up to speed and ready to start using the unit. So let's start as promised by having a really comprehensive tour 
of the controls here on this Flex 10. So we can divide the unit's top panel into four broad sections. The first of these is the browse section here and here, which we use to load tracks onto the decks. These are the decks. You have two, one on the left and one on the right. And these can each control two different decks, which are selected by these buttons here. This is the mixer section. And as part of the mixer, across the middle here and down here is the effects section. And these lights here are also to do with the effects section. So let's go and look at the browse controls in full detail. Everything that you can do with those knobs and buttons. One knob, two buttons on each side. Pretty much everything I'm about to show you is the same on both. It's just that when you finally come to loading a track, if you do it here, it will load the track that you choose onto the left hand selected deck. And obviously on the right hand, it will load it onto the right hand selected deck. So the browse knob lets you move through items on the library. So at the moment I'm in the playlists and collection side of the library, moving through everything that's available to me here. So if I reach a playlist that's got a track in that I want to play or a playlist that I want to use for a gig or whatever, in order to get into that playlist, I press down the button and it takes me into the playlist. Now my cursor is moving up and down in the playlist as I turn the knob. If I want to get back so that I can choose another playlist, I press the back button and I'm now back here. I can choose another playlist to go to any other music source that's listed here. Now, if I'm on a folder which contains playlists, again, I can just press the button. It will open that folder. And now I can look at the playlists within that folder. To close that again, I press the back button. So when I've picked a track I want to play, the way to load that track is to press the knob one more time. So pressing this knob now will load it onto the left hand deck and you saw it loading in the waveform there. Now, if I double press this knob, it will load onto this deck the track that is loaded onto the other deck. So that's now loaded onto this deck at exactly the same place. So that's of limited use, but what's of more use is something called instant doubles. And instant doubles is exactly the same thing, but in this instance, if you've got a track playing, on any given deck. So for instance, this track is now playing here and I want to double it over to the other deck in order that I can do some tricks with it or whatever. Then I can do that by just double clicking on the other deck. And I've now got two copies of that track playing perfectly together. It's a good little DJ trick. Scratch DJs are quite fond of this one because it means that you can quickly double a track over, scratch with the same track, a sample or whatever, and then have the track still playing on the other deck. Also useful if you, for whatever reason, you wanna free up a deck with the audience not knowing. You just set all the controls the same, instant double it and mix over into the new deck. Okay, I wanna show you now something that is actually not to do with the library, but it is to do with that knob. So before I forget, let's look at this function. So look once more at the waveforms at the top of the screen display. By holding down shift and turning the browse knob, I can shrink and expand the waveforms. And this can be really useful if you want to drill in in order to do beat gridding or just to see closely where you're putting your cue points and so on. Uh, and conversely, zooming out gives you far more of the track in view. So you can see when breakdowns are coming along, for instance, a little bit more easily if you can see more of the track that's about to be played. Recordbox has something called playlist palette which lets you have playlists permanently open on the screen that you may want to be referring to again and again. And you can switch through your playlist palette settings by using the shift button and pressing the palette button here. So if you look at the top left of the screen, you can see that I'm flicking through different settings here. And the blank area in the middle of the screen is where those playlists can be dragged to from the computer. So this is beyond the scope of this tutorial. It's a record box feature, but just so you know that's there when you're getting dug deeper into how to use record box. There's a shortcut there, so you don't have to do all that stuff on the screen once they're set up. And finally, the view button has three functions. The main function is to turn on or off that full library view that you can see there. It can be useful when you're selecting tracks to get more on the screen at that point. The second function is when you are in a list of tracks and you decide that you want to play one but not quite now, by holding down the view button, it adds it to a new list which can appear in the playlist palette that I told you about earlier at the top here. You see this list called tag list that I've just made appear. So now by selecting 
any tracks and then holding down the view button, they appear in that tag list and you can see them adding at the top there. This is a temporary list of tracks. It's a bit like pulling them out of a record box. Once you've played them, they disappear from that list. And finally, there's a useful related tracks item in that tree down the left hand side there that allows you to select an X track based upon criteria like BPM and key. So it's more likely to work with the track you're currently playing. And there is an easy way of getting to that menu from the view button. So instead of using the cursor to move up and down to find that related tracks there and pressing on it to make the related tracks show and then to pick one, we can just press shift and view and that related tracks BPM and key menu comes up there. And now we can look through them and find something suitable to play next. Now over in Serato, things are broadly the same with a few differences. Again, rotating the knob will move us through our current playlist. Pressing the back button will take us back to the left-hand view where we can select a playlist that we want to have a look at. Pressing it will take us there. Pressing again will load the track onto the deck. Double pressing the opposite deck will do the instant double thing like that. And if they're playing, of course, they'll both be playing then but you don't get the other double click on this deck. If you double click on one deck, you're just gonna reload the track that was there in the first place. So these buttons here, view, will go through the various views of Serato's software that are similar to switching to the browser view or the main view on Recordbox, but you get uh, certain extra views on here that uh, cycle through. And then with shift by pressing view, we go through four different extra views. You can see file, browse, prepare, and history in that top section there in Serato. And again, if we use the view button to go to a slightly bigger view there where we're just seeing the library, you can see those a little bit better. Uh, and prepare, which is similar to the tag tracks in Recordbox is the temporary window. And to add tracks to the prepare window, just press shift and back. Right, time to have a whistle stop tour of the deck. And we'll be coming back to a lot of these features when we look specifically again at Recordbox and Serato. But here's what we got. In Recordbox, these buttons let you save and also recall memory cues and memory loops, the kind of old fashioned way of having loops and cues with Pioneer DJ gear. This is a more thoroughly modern way of mixing. This is called Mix Point Select and it lets you pre-plan mixes ahead of time uh, in your set. We'll talk more about Mix Point Link in a little while. This is a quantized button that makes everything snap to the nearest beat or fraction of a beat when you're using cues and loops and so on to keep everything sounding tight. If you hold down the shift button and press this, it will wake the whole unit up if it's gone to sleep. The slip button allows you to scratch and use cue points and so on, while the track effectively carries on playing underneath what you're doing. And when you stop, the track carries on for where it would have been. Holding down shift and pressing this switches the whole jog wheel in and out of the vinyl mode, where at the top of it acts like a record or acts more like a CDJ jog wheel, which is a nudge kind of action. The jog wheel feel decides how quickly or slowly this thing slows down. Put it on light and it'll be very, very light in feel. Put it on heavy and it's much more tight in feel. You'll set this to something that's close to what you like. This is the main tempo control that slows down when you push up. Sometimes a little bit counterintuitive that if you're new to this stuff. Somewhere in the middle there is the tempo of the track at zero. Tempo reset will put the tempo back to zero and then lock this control. Turning that off again will enable it again. If you hold down shift and press this one, you can change the tempo range, which means it will slow down and speed up more or less depending upon what you set it to. And that will cycle through all the different tempo ranges that are available. Beat sync and then holding down shift and pressing beat sync will set this to the master deck, which all the other decks will sync to. This is the key sync button. And it's also the button that if you hold it down, will turn on or off what's called master tempo. Master tempo is where when you speed up or slow down the tempo of the track, the pitch stays the same or the pitch also moves up and down. And then holding down shift and tapping this button will reset the key to its normal key if you've used key sync to change the key of the track. These are your performance pads and these pad mode buttons here decide what is going to happen on the pads. So I'm going through different performance pad modes here and to get the performance pad modes underneath, you hold down shift and you press the different buttons underneath as well. These two buttons here cycle through the pages that are available to you on these pads. So there's actually 16 pads available to you in these functions, but there are only eight pads physically. So by going like this, I go to pads nine to 16 and then by pressing the other one, I go back to pads one to eight. If I were to hold down shift and press these buttons, 
it will cycle through the different modes that you can have on the in jog display so i'll do that now just to show you quickly what you've got we'll talk come back to the in jog display a little bit later but you can see those things changing in the middle there as I do that. If I hold down either of these buttons, doesn't matter which one, I'm gonna see on the InJog display information about what the current pad mode is set. So for instance, I've got two hot cues set in the current pad mode, and you can see that the first one is a cue, the second one, because it's orange and it's got that little symbol on it, is actually a loop and it tells me where in the track they are. So if you're looking at the screen of the computer to find that stuff. Moving around, this is our play pause button. This is our cue button, pressing it when the track is paused, we'll set a cue point at that point. Holding it, we'll play that cue point until we take our hand off it again. If you want it to carry on playing from there, you just press it and press the play button like that. And pressing it while the track's playing, will take us back to that cue point and wait for us to press play again. Pressing shift in the cue button will just take us right back to the beginning of the track. These beat jump buttons here, jump forward or back by four beats without breaking the rhythm of the track. Jumping forward four beats and back four beats like that. If I hold down shift and do it, it's 16 beats. So you can very quickly move through a track like this while holding the rhythm. Now, if I hold this button down, it quickly goes through the track while obviously messing up with the rhythm, but it's a quick way of moving through the track to find where you want to be. You've already seen me using the jog wheel a bit. When the track's playing, the top is the vinyl feel where you get that scratch function. The edge is nudge, slows it down and speeds it up like this. If you hold down shift and turn the top or the edge, it adjusts the beat grids of your track. Holding down beat jump and turning this is a really fast way of moving through the track without sounding the audio through the speakers. But you can see on the in jog display there how quickly that's moving as well as on the screen display. We've already mentioned the deck selector that's used to select between the two decks available on each physical deck. But if you hold down this when pressing shift, it will switch to dual deck mode, which will lock the decks together on the left hand side in this case, so that you can control them as one. Slip reverse will play the track backwards only for as long as you're holding the button down and then it will return to where it would have been before you press the button. Very useful for not playing curse words to your audience. And if you want to play full reverse, you hold down shift and press that button. So the difference is this. Notice the track's carrying on playing. But if I press shift in that, it will go backwards without stopping until I do the same thing again. And finally, Pioneer DJ's looping controls are pretty legendary. They're on all gear from, uh, from the smallest Pioneer controllers right up to CDJ's. But let's take a look at them if you haven't seen them before. So Pioneer DJ's loops are up here. You can get in and out of a loop. There's the exit button. Here's the in button. So if I want to start a loop, start it, finish it. That's now looping that section of the track there. If I want to adjust the in point, I hold down shift in that one like that. And now I can adjust the in point. Same with the out point, shift in that one. Again, to exit the loop, I press this button here. To put a four beat loop, press that button there. Now I've got a four beat loop. You can see it's telling me I've got a four beat loop here. If I want to double or halve the length of that loop, then I just press the buttons again. That doubles it to an eight beat loop, halves it to a four, halves it to a two, halves it to a one, half, and so on. There's also an active loop trigger, which is this here. You hold down shift and press this button here to turn on the active loop. Active loop means that the next loop that comes along that's been set in the track beforehand will be triggered automatically if you've done that. And if you do that again, then it will just go straight past it unless you do that manually. And the final controls here are new to the Flex 4 and they're to do with stems. They're these controls at the top then, drums, vocals, and instrumentals. So these will solo the drum or the vocal or the instrument part on the song, or they will cut out the drum, the vocal, and the instrument part on the song, depending on how you've got them set. And holding down the shift button and pressing these will do the same as I showed you on these with instant doubles, but it will do it with only the part that you've selected. So you can immediately take the vocal out of this deck and put it over onto this deck playing at the same speed and at the same place in the track so you can instantly then start messing with it, adding effects, scratching, or whatever it is you want to do. And you actually have to tap that button twice when you're holding shift. They've made it that way so you don't accidentally do it and mess up things and not know what's going on. So shift, two taps, instant doubles. 
I am going to demo that part, instant doubles for you, but I'm going to do it in the Serato section that we're moving on to now. It's exactly the same in Serato, but there is something I want to point out that's different about Serato. Right, so let's do that, move on to this controller with Serato. So a couple of things you need to know. The first thing is, because this is primarily a record box controller, the controls are labeled for record box, and that means that if you're using it with Serato, you're going to need to learn what the controls do in the instances where they're different. What I'm going to show you now is the controls that are different. And I'm going to, if I don't mention it again, it's because it works in exactly the same way as the way I've already shown you in Box. So if you've come to this section of the video as a Serato user, it is worth watching the Box section that preceded it, just so that you can understand the general, what the controls are meant to do, because this is the differences. And before we go any further, there's just one more thing I want to point out. If you've been watching this and thinking this looks really difficult, this is an in-depth controller and an in-depth guide to it but necessarily I can't go into every single function and teach you everything about your software. This is how the controller controls Recordbox and controls Serato. So if you're not very up to speed with what those platforms do and with the most powerful features of them, the stuff which isn't so obvious, which this controller gives you control over, I'll give you some resources at the end of this video where you can learn more about Recordbox and Serato, which will apply to any controller that you use. Right, okay, so let's get into Serato on this deck. If you remember, these buttons control memory loops and mem memory cues in Recordbox. There is no such thing in Serato. So instead, these buttons cycle you through your loops. You can see that moving through my saved loops on the screen there. If I hold down the shift button and press the one on the left here, then this is going to lock or unlock the loop slot so that the loop can't be deleted. If I do want to delete the loop with it unlocked, I hold down shift and press this button here and then that loop is deleted from that slot. Again, there is no mix point. There's no mix point select, no mix point link on Serato. So these buttons here are quite nice. They lower the key of the track. So with the track playing, we can hear that. And they push the key of the track up if you press the other one. Now, if I hold down shift and I press these buttons here, it selects another deck displayed on the waveform mode screen of the on-jog display. So this is the on-jog display and you can see other screens apart from this default one that comes up here. So in a minute, I'm going to show you how you can change what is shown on this display. And then after we finish this Serato talk through, we're gonna go into a lot of detail about what you can see on this display in both Recordbox and Serato. But just know then that if you hold down shift and press these buttons, you can change the waveform that's displayed on this display for that deck. The link button here turns key lock on and off. In other words, when the tempo slider is moving, this decides whether the pitch moves as well. And that is the same as holding down this button here called Master Tempo on Recordbox. I didn't demo it when we were looking at Recordbox, so let's have a demo of what that sounds like now. You can hear the pitch isn't changing here. The track's getting quicker and slower, but the pitch isn't. I turn that off. The pitch does change when I move the tempo. On record box, if you press the beat sync button with the shift button held, it sets this to the master deck. It doesn't quite work like that in Serato because this master deck thing isn't a thing in Serato. So instead, you hold down shift and press that button to turn beat sync off in Serato. Otherwise, it won't turn off. The key sync button does the same thing as it does in record box, but use it as your peril because Serato is not at the time of recording this using fuzzy key mixing. And that means that when you press this button, it's quite likely that in order to sync this deck with this deck, it's gonna move this deck's pitch ridiculously far and it'll sound rubbish. So for instance, we've got two track playing there, I've got track playing over on the other deck and I tell this one to sync to that. Listen to that, it's pushed it up so many notes that it sounds terrible. It's actually pushed it up six notes to make it fit. There's absolutely no need to do that. So come on Serato implement fuzzy key mixing, which we invented and which nearly everyone else has now implemented. Please do it. You know it makes sense. Right. We're going to go properly through the pad modes as I'm going to do with record box as well in a little while. But just for now, know that these two buttons here, unlike with record box where they cycle through up to 16 
pads here. Uh, they don't do that. They change the parameters of whichever pad mode you've got selected. So depending on the pad mode, these will do something different. Again, more coming up about this in a little while. Just like in Rekordbox, by holding down shift and pressing the pad selector buttons down there at the bottom, you choose which pad mode you want, whether it's pad mode one or pad mode two. But again, they are labeled differently. So you're not getting the exact ones that you're seeing here when you're using it with Serato. OK, I promised you we'd have a look at how these work, how you can use this to instantly double across two decks when you're using stems in order to put, say, the vocals over here and the instrumental on this really easily. It's the same in Rekordbox. The reason I want to show it you in Serato is I want to explain how Serato hand, or rather how the controller handles the different way stems work in both of those platforms. Because you see, in Rekordbox, you only get three stems, drums, vocals, and instruments. In Serato, you get four stems, drums, vocals, instruments and bass separated. So really those two instruments and bass are separated into two in Serato. That doesn't work that way here. Here, they're put together again. So when you're using all of the functions that we're gonna cover in this video regarding stems, just bear in mind that it has combined them for you into one stem on these dedicated controls at least, although you can still access the stems individually on the pads, which we'll get to. So bearing that in mind, let's have a look at how part instant doubles works. So as a reminder, drums, vocal and instruments allow us to turn on or off on any deck those parts of the track. So in this instance, I've got a loop here on a vocal track. There's just the drums because I've turned the vocals and instruments off or just the vocal. Vocal and instruments, drums and instruments, etc. However, if I want to double this deck over onto this deck so that everything that's going on here is going on here, same place, same tempo, same loop, then I can do that in two ways. I can do it with the standard instant doubles that we've already talked about, or I can use part instant doubles, which is what I'm gonna show you here, same in record box. So you hold down the shift button and you double tap the thing you want to move over onto this deck and it will start playing immediately. And as long as your crossfade is in the middle and your volumes are set the same here, you'll hear little difference. Sounds the same, right? But look, the vocal light's gone off here. The vocal light's come on here. Move the crossfader, just the vocal, just the instruments. And now I can start doing clever things with that. I can start scratching on the vocals or whatever. I can start looping away on the instruments, whatever I want, because I've now got two separate copies playing different parts of the same song. It's great for remixing and mashups and so on. So let's now move on and have a look at those jog wheel displays. I know you've been looking at them as I've been brushing over them. I wanna show you exactly what they do and all the different functions on both Rekordbox and Serato. So we'll start with Rekordbox. With the track loaded, the default mode is the deck info mode. And deck info has got a bit of everything. It's probably the one that you'll use the most. So the biggest number here is the BPM, the currently set BPM. This isn't the BPM the track was recorded at. So as I move the tempo fader up and down, that BPM will change, as will the percentage away from center. It's telling me how much I've speeded up or slowed down that track. This MT here is master tempo, and that's telling me that I've got master tempo engaged so that when I move the fader up and down to move the tempo, I won't also be moving the pitch. This is the musical key. This is in the key of 7A. You can change the key format in your record box settings. And this number here is telling me how far away from the original key this is. So for instance, if I press the key sync button to sync it to another track on another deck, I've now got this set to two semitones or two notes below, and you can see the key has changed in order to sync it with the other track. Here in the center, you can see these letters, A, B, C, and D, are showing me the cue points or loops that I've got set for this deck down here on the pads. And as soon as the track's playing, you can see this line that's appeared at the very beginning here, which is showing me how far through the track I am. I'm right at the very beginning of the track at the moment. This kind of zoomed in section underneath the main waveform where you've got the zero, which represents our current marker, our current play position. Minus four is four bars before our current play position. And then we've got four, eight, 12, and 16 bars after it. It's showing us where the cue points are or the loops are. So A, B, and C here. It's kind of a zoom in on this little bit here. 
to help you spot where cues and loops are coming up or what's just gone past in the track. Now this is the time that's elapsed or the time that's left. It's currently set to time left. You can change that in the record box preferences to whatever works best for you. Here, not yet lit up, but if I were to press this sync button here, that would light up, is our sync marker. This is our master deck telling us that this is the deck that currently other decks will sync to. And remember master can be turned on and off for any given deck by holding down shift and pressing the beat sync button. This is a very small version of the artwork for the track. This little tick here is telling us that the track is analyzed and ready for track separation or for stems. And just above that to the right, this number one here is telling us that we're looking at deck number one here. There's a little three over here. And if we'd switch to the other deck, that would be illuminated. These little white lines here, here, and at the bottom here and here are just telling us that the deck's turned on on our mixer. If we turn the deck off and so it won't play out to the audience, then they disappear. They're called on air markers. And with that fade it up again, they'll reappear here. You can actually switch the way the waveform looks in record boxes preferences. You can change the colors and you can change the size from a full to half waveform in there if you prefer that. So these two markers here, like hands of a clock, we've already actually seen the first one. And that is the digital marker that marks the position we are on the rotation. You can turn that off, remember, by double tapping the shift button, which I'm doing off camera now, and it disappears along with the other one. So what's the other one? The other one is telling us the cue point that we last played from or the loop we last played from. So if I were to press a different cue or loop down here, let's press a loop now. Uh, so going back to the view zoomed in here, you'll see that this is moved and this is telling us that that loop there, I'm now moving around and you can see the playhead has moved away from the loop but as i move further away as it gets to four beats which is what this is telling us after four beats it's going to loop back it will jump back to that marker and you'll see that happen there you go see it jump back there so this is the the last cue point or loop that we played from being shown to us there the next mode is waveform mode now remember we hold down shift and press these page buttons here to move between our display modes. So the display mode has now changed up here. This is similar to the mode we just looked at, but there are a few things different. So let's talk through them. We've got the big difference being that this is the waveform from the other deck. So we're basically getting a parallel view, which if you're used to using DJ software and having to look at the screen for this stuff, you'll find to be useful. It means that you really don't have to look at the screen anywhere near as much as before if you rely on this. Right, BPM is the same as usual. Master tempo, not on at the moment, but it's in the same place. If it were turned on here, you would see master tempo appearing in that top left-hand corner here. Key and key change amount are the same. Our cues are showing as well. So moving back to a cue there, we can see we've got the cues showing here and the loops will show in the same positions. Playback position is marked by the playback line here. This red line. When I'm paused is red, when I'm playing is white. Again, deck number, time, minutes and seconds elapsed. Again, everything else is pretty much the same. Artwork, sync, track separation status, on-air markers and the digital marker. The double waveforms is really the big difference on this view. Moving to the next view. It's just the artwork of the track as taken from the file. And if there's no file, no artwork will appear there. And the next one's cool. This is any DJ logo you've loaded. So I've got the digital DJ tips logo loaded up there. And the way you get that onto the system is by using the utility that you loaded when you loaded the software onto your computer for the Flex 10 right at the very start of this process. This is on the Mac. I believe it's in the settings utility on a PC. I don't believe there's a separate utility to do it on the PC, but you find it, you go find an image, drop it in there, it will say success. And then when you switch to that view on here, you can have your DJ logo showing there, which is cool. Over now in Serato DJ, I've got a track loaded on the left hand deck here, and you get some similar views here, but be, being Serato, it is tailored to that software. So the first view is the on jog display that we can see here. This is the closest to the virtual deck in Serato itself. So here we have the BPM at the top here. This is again the BPM as it's currently set. And this is showing us the deviation from the current BPM that's going on. 
Then we have this counter here, this number four, and this little loop symbol tells us that if we were to press loop now, we'd get a four beat loop. And this would be blue if it was engaged. And if it was a longer or shorter loop, that number would be a different number. The times here, you get both of them in Serato, both the elapsed time, which is currently 0.4 of a second, and the time left. And then you also have, same as in the record box implementation, the sync little button here. So if I press sync on the unit itself, then back on the display, this will be lit up. The master, which is over here for record box, doesn't show on here because Serato doesn't use the master deck in the same way that record box does. So the deck numbers are exactly the same. One here, if it was deck number three, this one here would be lit up. This here, plus minus eight, is telling us that if we were to move the pitch control all the way down or all the way up, it would go to plus or minus 8% of the current pitch. And then this can be changed with the pitch range controls. The little blue box with the kind of two link symbols in it is the key lock, it's pitch and time. It's Serato's version of locking the key so that when you change the tempo, the key doesn't change. And this is telling you that it's switched on. Talking of key, this is the current key of the track here. And if the key had changed to something different, that would show there as well. For instance, if you were synced to a track on the other deck that was in a different key. So for instance, if we were one note above, you see you get the plus one here. I just moved it one note above on the controls on the computer screen. So you also have the selected hot cue showing in this area here, the nearest hot cue. Now we're not very near to a hot cue at the moment on this track, but if I were to move, I'm just gonna use the mouse pointer to move to close to a hot cue on the waveform here, and then go back to show you what's going on here. Now you see we've got this yellow circle going on here. There's actually two things going on on this circle. The first one is this gray one, right? You see this gray one here? So it's now telling us we're about a third of the way through the track, right? And this will fill in as the track plays. And when that light gray area there is full, we finish the track. And you can see we're about a third of the way through the track just by looking at the time elapsed and the time left. But the interesting one here is this one here. So this is telling us that we are approaching the yellow cue. So on the screen, you can see the yellow cue. At the top where my mouse pointer is there, there's a yellow cue, it's also set here, and we can see it on the pads here as well. But on the unit, it shows us that on the in-jog display here. So if I press play on this track now, so I've hit the cue here, you so see I'm about to hit the cue there, right on that beat there. We can see it on the screen, we've hit the cue here on the beat, you can see the number 49 in the middle here is that where that cue is. But we get a visual display of that on here. And now if I press play again on this and move past that cue, you can see as the cue moves further away, we move further away from it here. So it's just a nice way of seeing an approaching cue or a cue that's just happened. And just the same as in Rekordbox, we have the digital marker that we can turn off if we're not interested in seeing it by double tapping the shift button like that, that will make it disappear on the screen. I'm gonna load another track, any other track onto the other deck as we move to look at the next view, which is the waveform view. So to move again between views, we hold down the shift and press these buttons here. So I'm gonna hold down shift and hold the right hand button that moves me to the waveform mode view. Again, most of this you've seen before, both on the previous view. So we've got things like the loop, now up here the loop, but we've got the BPM as well. We've now got the time left on the track. We don't have the time elapsed anymore. Uh, we've got the usual key information here. Key lock is on, plus minus 8% set and so on. But there are certain things missing. For instance, we haven't got the actual musical key showing here. Uh, we've got here the big difference, same as over in record box, which is parallel waveform. So this waveform is from that track I just loaded. It tells me it's the track over on deck two, and we can see both of them together here. So it's a, an easy way if you're used to mixing with parallel waveforms to see those on the display. So the final two views, again, shift and holding down one of these buttons here to move. We have the artwork display, and one more time off camera, this time I'm doing just that. Here we can see the DJ logo, and very basic information showing around here. So. In this instance, uh, the sync isn't turned on, but if it were turned on, you'd see that sync light lighting up there, just like I've shown you before. 
the deck number is showing here this white area here by the way is just a way of telling you you're on the main deck for that particular side of the controller so in this instance we're on deck one which is the main deck for here the main deck for over here would be deck two so because we're on deck one that's got the number one there but also it shows it in color here so white if i were to press this button here to move to the other deck just off camera here actually this button here then you'll see that we've got a blue number three and we've got this area switching to blue so that's just a way of making sure that you're clear which deck you're controlling you get used to thinking okay what color is it if it's blue i must be on deck three or one or two or four on the other side and i've shown you this before but if you hold down either of the page buttons doesn't matter which uh, without holding down the shift then on the on-screen display we get this display here and this tells us that it's the hot cue that we're currently set to on our pads i'll be talking to you more about the pads later and it gives us the two current pads and the timings for them so holding down either page button when you're on a pad mode will give you more information about that pad mode as i said i'll be looking at the pad modes in a little bit more detail in a while however now we've looked at the injog displays we've finished looking at the decks and so the next area that's left of course is the big area down the middle of the mixer we'll divide our guide of the mixer into the two main areas the two main functions of the mixer part of the flex 10 which is the actual mixer and then the effects so moving from the top down these switches at the top here decide what's coming through these four mixer channels and they're slightly different so the switches on decks one and four have got the settings a b and phono line so they refer to what's plugged in around the back so here i have a computer plugged in to a and that means that if this switch switch here is set to a then it's going to be taking audio from the computer that's plugged into a and the same with b but what's different about them is that you see here these are the inputs for external line and phono sources phono being record player line being cds and so on you'll see that the ones here are here I've got the choice of line and phono and there's a switch there that lets you switch between for instance the record deck and the cd and that's why on these buttons here the central one has got phono line written on here and just line written on here because on the four at the back that's how they're laid out you get the choice with one and four but you don't get the choice with two and three around the back here this is the master level it's literally the final volume control before the audio leaves the unit and this controls what's coming out of the master outputs these are the phono master outputs and we've got the xlrs to the right of there these are the booth outputs this is for the speakers in your dj booth and this is the volume control for those so you've got two separate volume controls going on there so these are the main output meters and you see the word clip there there's a red light will light up there if you're driving it so hard that the audio is distorting you never want that to happen so the master level indicator this is the master level indicator here it shows you the master output again you don't want to be driving this too hard into the red so these knobs here are called the trim knobs they're sometimes called gain or level on other mixes but they all do the same thing they are the first port of call for the audio volume on this channel so this is where you set the overall audio volume for the channel then we move down here to these which are the eqs low mid and high eq and these are where you adjust the bass, mid range and treble for each channel. You can have these set for either complete cut on the EQ, and I'll talk to you how, about how to do that in a minute, in a minute, or just reducing the volume for each of these sides. These can also be set to work with what we've already seen, the stems. So in other words, instead of low, mid and high, you're controlling stem in record box in which case the high knob is the instruments the mid is the vocals and the low is the drums and in record boxes preferences you can go to the track separation part and you can choose that as an option if you'd rather have them not as eqs at all just as controlling the stems you can't do it in serato that way so as we move down jumping over these because they're part of the effects we'll look at in a minute we have the cue buttons here these decide what you're hearing in your headphones so if you want to hear deck three in your headphones you'll turn that on you want to hear deck one as well or more usually instead you'll turn that one on and so on this little word underneath part iso is where you can switch out the eqs for what i was just saying by holding down shift and tapping this it will flash and that's telling you that this is now set to full kill on the low mid and high and you can see that flashing as I do it just to remind me of that 
If you want to turn that off again, press shift and tap it again, that flashing disappears and now they won't flash when you turn them and we're back to the normal EQs. There's a Q button up here as well if you want the Q function in your headphones to just simply be the master output. So no surprises here, right? Here are our main channel faders for the four channels and this is the cross fader for selecting what's played when we go to the left and the right based upon where these buttons here are set. So if you want the two decks on the left, which would be normal to play when the cross fader is to the left, we'll go like that and the two decks on the right will go like that. If you don't want to use the crossfader at all, you can set these to through, or if you want to use the crossfader for your main two decks, but not for the other two, for instance, if you've got some background loops running on the other that you want to run as you're mixing across, you can set these two to through and you can set it up that way. Just underneath the sampler Q button for hearing the sampler in our headphones, is the sampler volume. And just underneath are the headphones controls for what you hear in the headphones, the blend between what you've got set on the cues and the master here with a click in the middle to give you both, which is useful if you want to mix in just headphones and the overall volume for what's coming out of your headphones. Just a little tip if you're using the sampler features there in Serato, you don't have to do this in Rekordbox, but in Serato, if you want to make sure that this is all working how you would expect, then over in the software, just make sure that in the sampler section of the software, which you turn on and off by clicking the little air horn at the top, that you have this output here set to A rather than to anything else. And that will ensure that this works as it should. So finally to the microphone, this is the on and off button for the microphone. There's a light to tell you it's on. If you go to talk over, which will dip the music as you're talking, it flashes to tell you that that's set. And then there's the low and high EQs and the levels for both microphone one and two, the EQ is shared between both mics. Right, your first introduction to the effects area then, we'll look in more depth on how the effects work in a little while, but this is just your first intro to it. So here is the effects part select. This chooses what part of the track is affected by either these effects, the sound color effects, or these effects, the beat effects and release effects. So for instance, if I only wanted the vocal to be affected, I'd turn off the other two, simple, right? Obviously, this is only going to work on these channels that have got tracks loaded that have been analyzed for part separation or stems. It's not going to work on your microphone input and things like that. So moving down, this little screen here tells us the currently selected effect, and this is the effects selector. You can see the effect is changing here, and it'll tell us information about that effect as well. And this little number here, 105, is the current BPM that is being used by the effects engine to cycle through whichever effect you've chosen. So currently, this is set to 105. I can just set it to automatic by pressing Shift and the left-hand button here. And now it will automatically choose the BPM based upon the BPM of the set that you're playing. Or you can hold down Shift and press the right-hand button underneath and tap in the BPM you want, which can be useful if there's no beat in the track or the beat is hard for the system to guess. So this is the area where we choose how quickly it cycles based upon the BPM of the track. So by pressing this left hand button, it usually halves the BPM that's being used or rather the cycle that's being used. So this is currently a 16th of the currently set BPM. If I move up and go all the way up to 16 beats and everything in between. So we've already seen this. It's where we choose the effect we want. This is where we choose what the effect applies to. So it starts off with the sampler, then the microphones, and then decks three, one, two, and four. Notice that the lights are changing here to tell us what is gonna be affected by the beat effects based upon that. If I move it one more to master, then they all turn on because it's the master output that's being affected by this. This is how much of the effect we're gonna hear when we turn it on with the on button here at the very bottom. So for instance, if I have that in the middle, we're gonna get half of the normal noise and half of the affected noise all the way to the right. Then all we're gonna hear is the audio that's been through the effect and all the way to the left, we're only gonna hear uh, the clean audio, no matter whether this is switched on or off, won't make any difference. So moving up, this area here is where we dial in the sound color effects. This is where we choose the sound color effects that we want. There's six of them here. Filter is the most normal, but there's six more as well, or rather five more as well to give a total of six. And these will give us two variations on it, depending on whether we turn them left or right. When, are these in the, when these are in the center, you won't hear anything on that effect. And there's one more thing here that's different in Box than Serato, which is the release effects. We'll talk about these in a minute, but they're also on this button here. You hold down shift and press that button to turn the release effects on.
So we've already started to look at some of the connections around the back. Let's just formally run from left to right and make sure we've covered everything off. This is the Kensington lock socket, which you can use to secure the unit to make sure no one grabs it and disappears with it while you're not keeping an eye on it in public. Moving along then, these are our master XLR outputs. This is for balanced professional XLR cables. If you plug in any cable that is not balanced, you won't gain the benefit of these, which is they can carry the signal very cleanly over a long distance. This is the best one to use if you're plugging into a PA system that's more than say three meters or five meters away. Any cables longer than that that aren't balanced will tend to get noisy and you'll hear hum and buzz and so on. So use balanced cables to a balanced input from here if you want to plug into something that's quite a long way away from the unit. This is the unbalanced output and this is the standard RCA connectors and these are best if you're using a short connection, for instance, to another mixer that's nearby or to some speakers that are very close to you. Speaking of speakers that are close to you, in a professional environment, you will generally plug in to both the main PA system for everyone else to hear and to speakers in the DJ booth. And that's where these are important because this is where the speakers for the DJ booth plug in. And as I was telling you a little while ago, it's got this volume control on the top that says booth volume is for and making sure you've got separate control over what you hear compared to what the club hears. Again, these are balanced, so a different kind of balance to these, but nonetheless, if you use balanced TRS cables here to a balanced input, you'll get nice, clean audio. This here is when you've got turntables that have got not only a pair of RCA inputs like this, but also an extra lead for ground. Usually Technics turntables are like this. And again, this is all about stopping hum and getting a nice, clean turntable signal in. So we've had a look at this, you've got four external inputs on here. This one and the one on the other end can handle either turntables or line, and that's what that little socket there is for, and these two are just for line inputs. This here is amazing on this unit because it's not on any other at the time of recording this Pioneer DJ controller. It is a DMX socket. One lead from here into your lighting system will allow you to control it using Record Box. Record Box has got built-in lighting control. Unfortunately, there's no way of doing that with Serato. So again, we've looked at these briefly before. These are your two USB-C sockets for two computers, meaning you can DJ with two laptops. It's fun if you're playing back to back with someone or you want a nice smooth DJ to switch over. Uh, however, you don't need to have a USB-C input on your or, or socket on your laptop. You can easily use an adapter cable. So if your laptop has got the old style USB-A cable, then you can just get a cable that's USB-C, which is what this is, to USB-A and use it that way. And finally then, moving along, we've got the microphone inputs here. Again, these are both professional balanced microphone inputs. This here is a TRS, it's a quarter inch jack. This one here is actually also a quarter inch jack. That hole in the middle is quarter inch, but it's also XLR as well for the microphone. So if you've got a microphone that's either XLR or TRS, you can plug it in there. And actually there's something else around the back that sometimes people ask and aren't sure what it's there for. It's really useful, and that is this little piece of plastic here. So here's our power input. Unfortunately, it's not a nice big professional IEC. It's just a power brick, as you will already know if you own this unit. So it's got an external power brick with DC 12 volt power here. However, uh, and there's the on off button. Uh, however, this little piece of plastic here is for you to clip this on like that. And then that means that if you accidentally pull on this cable, you're not gonna rip this out and your music's not gonna go down and potentially damage the socket. I've got a old DDJ 1000 where the socket here, the little pin in this rather fragile plug has snapped off in the socket and that's something you don't want to happen to you. So good idea to always tuck that in there as soon as you've plugged it in to protect that connection. And the only thing we haven't covered then at the front of the unit, there's just two headphone sockets, an eighth inch and a quarter inch. No forgetting your adapter anymore. You have both choices there. Okay, let's look in more depth then at some of the features in both Rekordbox and Serato, concentrating on things like the pads and the effects and so on. But first, before we do any of that, we've got to make sure we've got our audio set up correctly, because if our audio is not set up correctly in our software, then it's not going to behave correctly when you're trying to get stuff to happen in your headphones and stuff to happen in your speakers. One of the biggest things people ask us here at the Digital DJ Tips School is, why can't I get something different coming out of my headphones to my speakers? Or why is the audio coming out of my laptop and not out of my sockets at the back of the unit or whatever, right? So we'll cover all of that now. In Record Box, you're gonna head up to the little cog at the top, and then you're gonna click on audio, and then you're gonna come down to this part here where it says audio. Now this is gonna be slightly different 
if you're on a Mac, which I'm on, to a Windows computer. But the important thing here is that you set, in these settings here, you set this to DDJ Flex 10. It might say DDJ Flex 10 ASIO or ASIO, but that's fine. Now down here, you need to make sure you've got these set as I have here. So the master output is set to DDJ Flex 10 master and the headphones output is set to DDJ Flex 10 phones. If for whatever reason you want the audio to come out of your computer laptop speakers as well, then you can click this little box here and that will output the audio from there as well as from the Flex 10 itself. Let's take a detailed look then at some of the record box features starting with using the performance pads. We'll talk through every single one of the features that you've got here. So we've got the pads and the pad selectors and the page buttons. We've looked at all of these briefly. Let's now actually use them to set some features and to perform some tricks. So hot cue is the first one we're gonna look at. Remember, these are the selectors. These will switch us between the different options that we've got down here. And we can also use shift to get to the ones written underneath. So just touching the first one will take us to hot cues. These allow us to start playback instantly from any part in the song. So to set a hot cue from any part in the song, press the hot cue pad that's corresponding to the one you want to set. So I want to set the first one here and you'll see this has changed color now. And also we have a hot cue on the waveform at the very top of your screen here. You don't have to be paused to set these. You could actually be playing the track. I've paused the track now and I can now jump back to any of these hot cues like this. We've seen this before briefly, right? This is the way of quickly setting places in the track that you want to jump back to. Remember, page will give us a whole other page of hot cues. This is a whole new page here I can set for a total of 16. Just to let you know though, that if you set a loop by pressing the loop button there, you can save that loop to a hot cue slot. Look at the top of the waveform there. You can see the loop I've just set by pressing a spare hot cue button. Notice that this now lights up in orange, which tell it, tells us that this is a loop I've saved here and not hot cue. So in this instance, whereas before I was jumping back to hot cues here, I jump back to the loop. And again, as I showed you earlier, holding it down and tapping play will loop that for me. To delete them, press either of the shift buttons, this one here or the one over there, and tap what you want to delete. There you go, I've deleted everything I just added there. So unique to record box, we have the pad effects. These are a really nice way of adding an effect that sounds great by literally just pressing one button. So these work by selecting pad effects. So I've gone from hot cue there to pad effects. And just holding down one of these buttons. So if you keep an eye on the screen, it's showing us. When I switch to that, the screen switched to show us what we were doing. Just on the roll and the sweep, there's a flange. That's called a release effect. You see the little R by it? And this is an effect that's slightly different because it actually stops the track playing, right? So this track stopped while my finger's on it, take my finger off and it carries on. It's a vinyl brace re break release effect. This is an echo, a half beat echo. That's against the quarter beat we just had, a reverb and a release echo. These two can be really useful for quickly stopping this track, mixing out of it and starting another track playing. That's a good use of release effects. So there's more. So how do we get to the other ones? Well, use the page buttons here. Let's move the page button, can turn that off. Move the page button down to the next set of effects. So we've got a transform, a crush effect, a low frequency oscillator filter, it's going round every four beats. That's what the little number four means in the square on the screen. Another release, this is a backspin. And then you've got a delay, dub echo, space, another kind of echo, and another release echo effect. But there's more than just those 16 because written underneath that pad there, it says pad effects too. And so by pressing shift in that, 
it now flashes and I've now got Pad Effects 2 selected on here. You'll notice on the screen that it's changed as well, telling me I've got a different set of effects dialed in, slip loop of four different lengths on the top, which will give me a loop, but then when I take my finger off the button, it will carry on where it would have been. We've seen a variation on this before, and reverse roll as well. Let's have a listen to those. <laughs> And I can use the page button again to select another set. So here we've got transform effects across the top and delays across the bottom. Just to let you know what the transform effect is doing is effectively cutting the crossfader in and out very quickly to give you that effect. And a mind-blowing thing is you've got full control over these. So you can click this little cog here and you can change what's set. And there's so many options here for you to switch to among all the different kinds of effects in the software. So you can configure these to your heart's content. It's a really powerful way of setting up the pads when it comes to the effects exactly how you want them. Now remember I showed you the beat jump controls. There's another way of using beat jump using the pads. So just to remind you, beat jump is where we use these buttons here, there's another set over here as well, in order to jump four or 16 beats backwards or forwards in the track while retaining the flow of the rhythm. And so if we want to use the pads to do that, we can do it a bit more granularly because we can get more than just four and 16 beats as our choice. So beat jump, press the beat jump button to get to them, they'll light up slightly red like this, and look at the area that tells us what's going on on the pads. And it's telling me that when I use this button here, I'm jumping backwards and forwards by a single beat in the track. And you can see it happening on the waveform. You'd normally do this when you're playing the track, by the way. And then here we can do it by two beats. You can see that four, eight. And then using the page button, we've got 16, 32, 64 and 128. So the 128 is going to jump. Look how quickly it's jumping through the track. Look at the lower waveform, right? So this will all happen when we're playing the track on the beat. So it shouldn't sound too bad when we're doing it. Really easy way of quickly moving forwards and back in the track if you want to extend it because people are loving it or you want to quickly get near the end because people aren't without most people noticing most of the time. Useful set of features. Just a reminder too that holding down either of the page buttons will give you this lovely view of exactly what you've got set on the pads. So you don't have to look at the screen to remind yourself in this instance which pairs of buttons are going to do the 1632 64 and 128 beat jump backwards and forwards. Let's look at how to use the sampler then. Go into the software, you're going to need to do this on your screen and at the top of the screen find this little matrix, this little grid and press that and that's going to bring up this sample area that you can see that's just appeared at the bottom here. Once you've done that you can use the mouse pointer to drag and drop samples into these slots here that represent the samples that we're going to be playing or you can use the rotary selector at the top of the screen. Either way, we're going to want to get some samples into our slots. I've just loaded one into that first slot there that you can see. Once you've done that, they'll appear down here. They'll light up to show that you've got a sample there. And I'll press play. Make some noise. Make some noise. Make some noise. There you go. Rather cheesy. Make some noise sample. Now, the three things I did there then, pressing it to play it. Pressing it again to play from the beginning. Make, 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 make some noise. And pressing shift and tapping it to stop it before it's finished. The other control you're going to want here is the sample volume control. Make some noise. Yeah. <laughs> really is a cheesy one, isn't it? And so with the combination of putting the samples you want onto the pads, using shift to stop them when they've played for long enough, or just letting them play out. Filling them up with the samples you want. You've got page after page of samples here, and you'll see on the screen the pages here showing you which page you're currently on. So lots and lots of 
places for you to pack your favorite idents, jingles, samples, and so on into record box. Now, keyboard mode lets me take a hot cue that's already set on a track. Usually you'd set it at a vocal or a, a stab of music that you like, and it lets you play that as if it were a sample on a keyboard. And so you can reinvent riffs and tunes based upon stuff that's in the tracks you're playing. It's really powerful. It's a lot of fun. Let's have a look at how that works. First thing, you're going to need a hot cue somewhere in a track that you want to use as a keyboard note. So let's start this track playing. I want to break down here. Right, so let's take one of those piano stabs there. Let's take that one there and put it on a hot cue. So I've got a hot cue set. And I've put it on a hot cue. Now I'm going to press shift and hot cue to go into this keyboard mode here, right? So the first thing it's doing is flashing all my hot cues. These are actually my hot cues flashing and it's saying pick one. Now we've only got one hot cue set on this track, which is why this one's in green and the other ones aren't. So I'll pick that one. It's now taken that note. And what we're going to do is play that note across all the pads. So this white flashing one is flashing because that's the original note. So it's just playing the hot cue from there. As soon as I take my finger off it, it goes away again. But I can go up. Even higher. To the point where it sounds pretty weird, right? But then I can go down as well. And keep going down. And there's even other options here, which you can see on the screen, like a whole octave up or down, or five notes down, or seven notes up, or semitone up or down. And if you've got something going on on the other deck, you can key sync to it as well. It's a powerful way of reinventing songs to add melodies to them that weren't there in the first place, just from a riff. And you can play this over the top of music. So you might just go. For instance, and I've instantly remixed that song based upon one particular note in the song. So kind of related to that is key shift mode. So key shift basically does the same thing, but it doesn't need a hot cue. It doesn't take a sample. It just lets you move the key up or down of a, of a playing song or of a song before you're playing it in order to get it to the key you want it in. Because if you think about it, the controls that we've got on the unit give us a key sync, which will sync up the key to the other deck, or we can use master tempo to lock the key of the track but we can't move the key up or down by a note or two using controls here. We need to go to the pads to do that. So let's go out of keyboard mode now. I'm going to go to key shift mode by pressing shift and key shift. It now flashes and we're now in key shift mode. It does look quite similar, doesn't it? We've got a flashing. This is our original key here. So let's start the track playing. So now it just moves the whole song up by one note and the whole song up by another note or down and we can go down all the way and we can do all the kind kind of things I just showed you on the other mode but this time it's effectively not going back to a hot cue it's just letting the track play on as that happens so let's take a look at the beat loop mode to get to beat loop press shift and press the beat loop button it will flash to tell you you're in the beat loop mode and now I can trigger the beat loop by pressing any of the pads look on the screen and you can see the beat loop length I'm going to get so if I wanted to trigger a half beat loop while this track was playing I would press the button down here. A one beat loop, two beat. If I want to go higher, I can press this button here and trigger higher loops. And if I want to go lower, I just carry on moving down. I'm sure you've heard that effect a lot with DJs halving, 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 halving again, and then finally releasing the track to build tension. That's how it's done. It's effectively the same as the way we showed you earlier on the other loop controls, but it's another way of getting to that. You can also jump from small to high in a way you can't on the other controls because on the other controls, you've got to go past all the other values to get to the one you want, whereas here you've got a bit more flexibility. Right now, we briefly touched on the slip mode button and we talked about how slip works with slip reverse, but I want to show you some features that the slip mode button enables, especially one which involves these pads, because there's a feature that is not on the pad. So if you're coming from another controller, you might miss and I'm going to show you how to replicate it here. But in order to do that, let's just look at slip mode in general and I'll cover three or four use cases of slip mode. So remember, slip mode will allow us to let the track keep playing underneath while we're doing something else. And when we finish, the track will return to where it had been. And so the easiest way to demonstrate this so you can be crystal clear about what it does is I'm going to start the track playing. I'm going to turn on slip mode. 
and then I'm going to stop the track playing. And what I want you to do is keep an eye on the waveform at the very top of your screen there and watch what happens to the playhead when I stop the track playing. So once again, I'm going to start the track playing, turn on slip mode and then stop the track playing. Keep an eye on that top waveform. OK, I'll stop slip mode now. Did you see what happened there? Did you see that playhead moving away even though I stopped the track playing? That's because I turned slip mode on and that was a marker as to where the track would have been had I not stopped it, you know, because when slip mode's on, it will keep a, an eye on where the track would have been had you not done anything. And so if I were to press play again, then it would carry on not from where I press stop, but from where that playhead had reached. So this time, let's do that. Let's press play again with slip mode on. I'll just stop the track and start it playing again and then we'll see what would happen. See the usefulness of it now? As I was stopping and starting it quickly, it was sounding like I was doing something with the track. It was sounding like I was DJing a bit and yet the track was keeping time underneath. It's a great way of getting experimental on the decks while not worrying about everything staying in time underneath. So now you understand the basic principle of what it does. Let's look at a few uses for slip mode. So one use is with your hot cues. So with slip mode turned on and with your hot cues marking certain parts of a track, you can play the hot cues. So we could use it, for instance, with the uh, moving the pitch around mode on the keyboard hot cues. I'm not going to do anything as complicated as that here. It's going to show you a very simple way with just the usual hot cues that you could kind of restructure the track with slip mode on. And then when you finish, it just carries on from where it would have been. So let's go back to slip mode on. I'm going to hit play and I've got some hot cues set here. Let's just turn it off while I play you the hot cues. So I've just got hot cue set on various parts of the breakdown of this track. Uh, let's do it. So there I was just playing hot cues. It was jumping to the hot cue I pressed and the second my hand went off it, the track carried on playing. And of course, you'll find much more useful and interesting ways of doing it than I did there. So another interesting use here is just to build on what I just showed you when I was just stopping the track. So we're going to go into record box here. This is not a record box tutorial. We've got a whole course on record box, but we need to go into record box here just for me to show you a setting because when you know where that setting is, you can perform this and it's pretty cool. So in the software, you're going to go to the preferences at the top. You're going to go to controller and deck and you're going to find vinyl speed adjust. So just turn up where it says touch and break, turn up this control to, I don't know, somewhere about halfway, maybe there. Uh, I'm gonna do it on all four decks and then get out of there. Now, when I press pause, play pause, it won't stop dead, it'll do this. You hear that vinyl kind of stop? If I'd have turned that knob up further, it would have, would have taken longer to stop. But that'll do for now, because now with slip mode on, just using stop and start, I can get a really nice DJ vinyl sounding effect. What if you want to do that manually? What if you want to grab the turntable and do a few baby scratches? Oh, I can't scratch, but I can make it sound half decent with slip mode. Instead of stopping the track or instead of having the vinyl break effect when you press stop to give you that vinyl sound, you can just grab the jog wheel, put it in yourself, knowing that when you take your hands off, the track will carry on where it had left off. Something like this. So as I was saying a minute ago, if you're coming from other software, there might be a pad mode that you miss here, which is the kind of slip roll pad mode, which lets you do loop rolls while having that quality I've just been showing you where the track carries on playing underneath. Because on this controller, we've got the beat loop, right? We've got this one here, which will give us a nice.
but we haven't got the ability for that to carry on playing after we stop. There isn't a slip loop. In other words, when I do a loop like this and I start it playing again, it carries on from where it, where it is. And that's not what we want. So the way to fix that is to use the slip button. You just have to engage this before we use the beat loop. So let's go back to a hot cue at the beginning of that breakdown. I'm gonna to go to my beat loop section. And this time I'm gonna turn on slip mode and I'm gonna use some uh, beat loops. And that's how you do it on a controller that has got record box software and that doesn't have a slip loop on the pads. Just turn on slip mode and get on with it that way. And finally, probably the most difficult one to get to sound good, but if you are James Hype, uh, who made uh, that amazing DJ course and the production course with us and who I'm sure you've seen uh, on, uh, on YouTube doing his stuff, then this is something similar to what he loves to do, which is you can set a manual loop and then you can use the jog wheel to adjust the size of the manual loop. So instead of halving it and halving it and halving it, you're literally using the jog wheel to decide how much shorter it gets at your choice of timing. And the beauty about doing this with slip mode is that you can be doing this and you can be keeping an eye on that moving cursor that we saw at the beginning. And as soon as it hits like the drop or something, you stop and everything kicks in. And it's a real nice mix of you doing something that's completely freeform, completely off piece, but at the same time, you've got the backup of knowing that when you're finished, it's gonna kick in right where you want it, right? So it's a good little hack to know. Let's try a manual loop with slip mode and we'll get out of it just as the drop hits on this track to give you an idea of what's possible with that. It's a good performance trick, right? It looks good. Another thing that looks good is to be able to start your track playing with just the fader. And this is just more fun maybe than tapping a hot cue button. So if I wanted to start the track playing from here, for instance, and I've got a hot cue there, great. Same with the temporary cue, set a temporary cue there. But I can also start the track playing from where the temporary cue is set by using the shift button and the actual fader for that channel. So for instance, if I hold down shift now, I'll get the same thing. It's gonna start from where the temporary cue is. And it's exactly the same with the crossfader. With the crossfader fully over to the other deck, holding down shift. Again, I could just do it on here. But hey, it's just nice to know you've got these things, right? Different ways of doing things and not all controllers have that. So in Serato, pretty much everything I just told you is the same. You've got exactly the same looping functions. You've got exactly the same slip functions. You've got the same fader starts. The pads function in a similar way but there are differences because of the differences in the way the pads work in those two pieces of software. So let's talk through those quickly now before coming back to some other stuff, including these effects. So hot cues, exactly the same. Notice in Serato, the hot cubes are the hot cubes. The hot cues are coming up in different colors as opposed to being green for cues and orange for loops, which you get in Recordbox. You can change that in Recordbox, by the way, if you prefer multicolored cues, uh, but you do exactly the same thing to add them and to delete them. Pad effects, you get standard pad effects across the top and you get release type effects across the bottom. We've seen these in Recordbox, right? So. Now there's no screen display to show you what they are, but we know how to do that. Press down this button here and then it will show on the screen. So you can see we've got echo, flanger, reverb and repeat I showed you across the top and the release type effects, echo out, breaker 
backspin, backspin and roll out there. Beat jump is on the same button that says beat jump for record box, but the pads do something slightly different for beat jump. So with beat jump, they are beat jump left and right. And these two change the amount of the beat jump by halving and doubling it, which shows on the screen. So that's now one beat back and forward. And that's all the way up to 32 beats forward and back. The green ones across the bottom there on the beat jump on Serato are nothing to do with beat jump. They are your previous track or beginning of the track. So right back to the beginning there. And then a quick search through the track. And that's the same as using slip reverse for sensor. There's just another sensor button. Really, this stuff is all there in case you've got a smaller controller, for instance, it doesn't have a sensor button there. And so another way to get back to the beginning of the track, as we've seen before, is just to hold down shift and press Q like that, which will do the same thing that this button here does. Again, just different ways of getting to stuff. Serato Sampler is really powerful, but the controls that you get on the unit are similar to the ones that we saw on Rekordbox. So I'm going to just change the view in Serato here slightly. I'm going to open the sampler by pressing the horn at the top here, but then I'm just going to change the view to this view here, just so that I can get the control on the screen at the same time. Here are the sample slots then, and you can see I've already loaded a sample onto the first of these sample slots that are available to you. And by pressing sampler on the unit itself, you can see that that sample slot is lit to tell me that this will play. Make some noise. Make some noise. Shift and touching it will stop it even though it's still playing as well. And like I say, it's a very powerful sampler. People have whole controllers mapped just to work with Serato sampler. So our Serato Made Easy course is a place to go if you want thorough tuition on how all of that works. From the Flex 10's point of view though, they are the controls that you've got. Pitch Play in Serato is that software's name for keyboard mode, which we've seen in Rekordbox already. It's actually on the same keystroke down here. You press Shift and hold down this. So I've already got a hot cue set on a note. That's the note I want to use in uh, keyboard mode or pitch play as it's called here. Shift and hot cue will put me into that mode. And the white one is the current pitch, but I can go up or down. And I can again, I can use the page buttons to move between. On the Serato implementation of this, you can always see the current pitch, it never disappears. So the current pitch is there, but now all the notes are above. And then back down here. Now all the notes are below. Remember when we were looking at record box and I showed you how to use slip with the beat looping to get a slip roll effect. You don't need to do that in Serato because it has one on the pads. This is one that is not labeled. So by pressing shift and pad effects one, it goes into this mode here. And you can use the page button as well to move between different high and low values for that. And again, you can always hold down either of these buttons here to see the current values that you've got set on the InJog display, which is really useful. And by the way, you do still have the beat loop function. It's actually still labeled the same as well. Shift and beat jump, same as in Rekordbox. We'll give you the same behavior that we saw over there. Also the same as the record box is key shift. Shift and sampler, it's labeled the same as well. The whole track, up or down, moving away from this white home note here. And page again will give you various options. You can get to really high or really low there. No difference at all to the way it works in record box. If you're coming to this unit from a unit that had Serato flip controls, and if you don't know what Serato flip is, again, our Serato Made Easy course goes into great detail about this, but effectively it's the way of recording a sequence of hot cues so that when you play a track back, it jumps where you jumped. So you can kind of like make rough and ready remixes and get even more creative with it. But the thing is you need a pad mode to control it. Well, there is one on here. And to get to the flip pad mode on here, you hold down the hot cue button uh, and then you get into this 
mode here, which is different to keyboard mode. This is actually flip mode. So now by touching one of these, I can save a flip. By touching it again, I can trigger that flip. If they're lit up, that means they've got flips saved to them. And holding down shift and pressing one of the pads will delete the flips from here. Again, there's no time to go into what these are in this tutorial, but do take a look at the Serato Made Easy course if you want more info on that. I think one of the best things about this unit and the DDJ-1000 before it is the way effects are implemented because it sometimes is using the effects in software. Sometimes it's using built-in effects, which are great because it means that you can use anything plugged in around the back to have the effects work as well. But more importantly, the look and feel is far more normal for DJs used to playing on club gear because early controllers had quite complex control over the very complex and very good built-in effects engines in software. But... DJs as a whole found that too complicated and then ended up struggling to use them. Well, here they are exactly the same as you find on a club mixer. Certainly the layout and most of the functions are exactly the same. So fun bit, let's talk through all the effects you've got. So we talked about this earlier. You can choose what you want to be put through the effects here. Just the vocals, just the drums, just the instruments where a channel works. The screen will tell you about the effect. This decides how quickly the effect cycles as a factor of the number of beats. You can also use the shift button to set this to automatic or to tap it in yourself manually. This actually chooses the effect and you can see the effect changing on the screen as I scroll through these. This chooses where the effect goes and again the numbers at the top, uh, the uh, lights at the top just show you underneath the number of the deck, which deck is gonna be uh, involved with the effect, or you can have the microphone or the sampler or go to master and then they'll all be on. This is just the source, just the effect, a mixture of the two in the middle, and this is your on off button. Let's have a listen to them. We're gonna start with the low cut echo. So what that's doing is echoing out the track but removing the low frequencies so the echo sounds nice and clean. It's a good all round echo to use. The screen is telling us the number of beats that are being echoed. So it's echoing one beat. If I move that down to three quarters or half a beat, you'll get a shorter echo. Now I'm moving the fader across because we often use echoes to get rid of tracks or we want the echo to be more audible. So the fader being across means that you're only hearing the echo, but you're also then getting the uh, effect of what's called post fader effects. In other words, when the fader is switched off, you can still hear the audio. These are all post fader. The next one is a full echo, which is the whole frequency range. The next one is a multi-tap delay. Now this one sounds a little bit more musical. It's got a little bit more of a rhythm to it going on. I'm gonna set it to quite a high value to show you this one. Just another variation on the echoes we've got going on here. So the next one is spiral and spiral is a reverb type effect and if you mess around with the timing you can get some quite musical sounding uh, output from it. So let's have a little play with spiral. Gives you that kind of riser effect that can be very nice in a breakdown like we've uh, got going on there. So reverb is a more standard reverb effect. and you can dial in the amount of the reverb up here at the top. So transform cuts the track in and out. We've already looked at the transform effect because we saw it on one of the pad effects. Transform, you set the number of beats or the fraction of beats you want to cut in and out here, and then turn it on and it will do the equivalent of the crossfader being cut in and out for you without you having to do anything. This is one of those where the level depth knob is worth using because the more you have it round to the right, the less of the sound you hear. So the next one is Enigma Jet. We're moving on to the flanges and phases now. These are kind of like the rotating speaker effects. Imagine a speaker uh, on a pole rotating and what it would sound like. Also, they're quite similar to when a an emergency vehicle goes past you and you hear the siren changing tone as the vehicle drives past, right? We've all heard that. And these are all kind of similar to that.
Again here, the effect rate is what's being set by this. Very different sound when you have it going around very quickly as opposed to going around slowly. I prefer personally longer flanger sounds and phaser sounds. The next one is a standard flanger. And then the original rotating speaker effect. The phaser. So the next one is stretch. It gives a time stretched sound. You hear the original sound and the time stretch version of it there. Beloved of drum and bass and speed garage DJs back in the day. Right, the next two are the roll effects. So we talked earlier about how we don't have an actual slip roll effect on the pads because they're not one of the pad effects that have been programmed. And I told you how you could use the slip button with the usual roll effect, the usual beat loop effect to create that roll. Well, there's another way of doing it down on these here. So you trigger it by using the, uh, the on button and I'll have it with the level depth to the top here so you're only hearing the slip. That sounds like this. We've all heard that effect right. You can do the half and half and half again type effect on that one. And the slip roll effect will resample the song every time you move this value up or down. So it'll take the currently playing bit of the song. You've got exactly the same effect on the next one, but it won't do that resampling. It'll just take the original thing that you pressed the button when it was playing, that's what it will use. And the last two, the Mobius effects, I always like to think of these a bit like those Escher paintings where you think you're at the top and then you're at the bottom again. Uh, these kind of introduce a new tone to what's going on. They're very useful in breakdowns and so on because they can add more, uh, add more of uh, the excitement that you want just building up to a drop, but it's up to you when they end. They kind of never got, a, never got an end. Anyway, let's listen to one. You're definitely going to want to, these, want to use these with the level down a bit so you can hear the music. You hear it gets to the top and it kind of doesn't go away. And also notice I can turn the music off and it's still there. That's because these effects are adding something to the noise, a bit like the noise effect we're gonna see in a minute on the sound color effects too. And there's another variation of it here. Just a softer variation of the same effect going on there. Now, if the beat effects are simpler than software effects as implemented in Serato and Recordbox, then the sound color effects, speaking of those, are even more simple. They, their, their advantage is how immediate they are, how much fun you can just grab the effect and add it, add it as soon as you want. There's no sense of a cycle that you've got to set, one beat or half a beat or whatever. It's totally in your control. And the reason it's totally in your control is that you turn the effect on and off by moving these knobs to the left or right of center. So you can only have one sound color effect for the whole mixer. You can't say, I want this one for this or this one for this. This is where you select the sound color effects and whichever one you select is going to work across all of these. This was originally just filters, right? When this idea first appeared of having an extra knob underneath the EQ knobs, it was just filters, but it's developed into what we see here, six different effects. Let's have a listen to them then. I think we should have some music that's a little bit more relaxing than drum and bass this time around. Okay, so the space effect is a reverb. This effectively sounds just like two types of reverb. You always get two types of the effect as you move it left or right. So in the uh, counterclockwise uh, direction, it adds it to the mid range and low range like this. You can hear the hi-hats there is still coming through perfectly and they're not affected. And it's the opposite in the other direction. You can hear it's affecting the other frequencies there. It's the, uh, the mid range and the high range that are getting the reverb. So a little trick here is if you want to start the effect like quite heavily on, you can turn the effect off and start like that. And if you want to end the effect when it's heavily on, you don't need to move it back to the center and hope you get it right. You can just press the button there. In this instance, it still sounds for a little while because it's an echo effect, right? So the next echo is the dub echo. It sounds like this.
mid range to the left and to the right high range. Gives that kind of highly rhythmic feel that you hear on dub records, hence the name. The next one is Crush. Crush will give you a kind of 8-bit lo-fi sound. The difference when you're going to the left is that it's applying a high pass filter as well. So pitch changes the pitch. Uh, this is low to the left and high to the right. Noise is a bit like the Mobius in that it introduces a sound that wasn't there before. So as I was saying, an interesting thing about the noise effect, just like the Mobius effects that we saw over on the beat effects, is that it's added over the top of the music. It's separate from the music. And so I could throw up another channel and introduce the noise to that channel with no music playing, same thing. And then filter, the classic, a low pass filter. It's like a very musical sounding EQ. You get the whole lot on one knob, which is helpful. And high pass to the right. Right, if you really want to be a master of the Flex 10, then you need to understand how to change the settings for both Rekordbox and Serato, and those happen in different places, and also the settings that you can only change on the unit itself. This is the stuff that lets you really customize how it works so it suits the way you DJ. So while this is complicated stuff, it's well worth understanding how it all works. And before we get on to that, which is the final part of this tutorial, there's another quite complicated thing that we haven't touched on yet, which is a record box only feature, which I think is over the top of most people's heads and probably, to be honest, mine as well. However, I'm going to explain it to you. You decide if you want to use this. You decide if this is something that's useful for your DJ. It's called Mix Point Link. So let's have a look. Mix Point Link links a cue point, a hot cue, near the end of the outgoing track with a hot cue near the beginning of the incoming track. It's designed for long beat mixes. And the idea here is that when your outgoing track reaches a cue point that you mark at a place where maybe the music start, stops being quite so interesting, the incoming track is lined up with it at a point where the music is getting interesting on this track. And so it allows you to do that very quickly and automatically. And it will start this track at the beginning so that those cue points line up. So the easiest way is to show you. I have a track playing on this deck here, and I want to mix in this track here. And so I know that when this track here reaches Q point H, somewhere near the end of it, it stops being interesting, it's just drums. And I know that this track here, when it reaches Q point B, which I've got marked, it's when the bass line comes in and it starts to be interesting. So I want that Q point there to line up with Q point H on that deck. So here's how you do it. On the incoming deck, using the, the screens here to, to make it all clear to yourself, on the incoming deck, make sure you've got B set on the incoming track. And then on mix point link, press these buttons. And then on the bottom track, you'll see the bottom track suddenly freezes. And it lets me choose a cue point. And I want that cue point to line up with my cue point on the top deck. Once I've done that, I press link. Now it's going to automate this mix for me. You see now on my screen here, the top one is frozen and it's waiting on B. Watch the waveforms. You see what happened there? It started the other track playing and the other track's now playing over here. Look, there it is. There's one, there's the other one. This one's just the drums at the very beginning and this one is still the bass line. It started it playing and it started it playing at just the right place so that when the tracks reach the point here where Q point B on the incoming track, which remember in this case is where my bass line comes in, lines up with Q point H on the old track where the old bass line disappears, it sounds good. Here they come, let's listen. And there we go, it's worked. The bass line is in on that track and there's just drums on that track. It's automated that for me, it's lined them both up for me and it's performed that mix. Now what it hasn't done is do anything here. It's up to me to have everything set here how I want it. 
I would probably be, if I was in front of the gear at the time, slowly blending between the two. But I guess what it solves is that you can tell it where you want the, the transition to be and it will start this track playing so that that happens automatically. Just one less thing to worry about. And when you get used to it, it's not so hard to dial in a cue point and dial in a cue point on the other deck, especially when you're using these screens in the middle here to watch what's happening. Although it does all happen over on the main screen as well. You can see on there what's going on. Now there is one little variation here. You will have noticed there that when it started the track playing, started the new track playing, we could hear it, right? Right from the very beginning, it was audible. If you don't want it to be audible, when you're setting this up, let's just uh, kind of, I won't perform the whole thing again, but I'll show you how it works. When you're setting this up, so this track's playing, we want to mix this track in. Uh, so I'm going to cancel mix point link there. We'll start again. I want to mix this track in. I want to do it from point B. I want to do it from the H Q point here. So mix point link, click link. What I can do is press shift and click link again. It's got silent written underneath it like that. So what that's going to do is start the track playing, but it's going to silence it. And that means that I won't hear the incoming track until we reach those mix points. So just gonna, we'll give it a uh, few seconds to let that happen. And you'll see on this screen that you get them both playing, but it'll dim out the track on the top, the one that's coming in, which tells us that it's not playing. And I'll show you on the cross on the faders as well. This time around, I think about four bars away from this happening now. Have you guessed what the other reason you might want to use this is yet? Have a think. All will be revealed afterwards. Right, here it comes. Right, you see this is greyed out? Now, there's nothing going on on the incoming deck at all. Nothing. It's playing, but it's muted it. Only the outgoing deck is playing. And it's going to stay like that until the incoming deck reaches the mix point link point. And then it will make the mix live for the incoming deck so you've got that choice there of having the incoming deck playing or not as you work up to the cue point you can't curiously make the outgoing deck go away at this point i don't think anyway here we go and there's the new chart playing if you want to cancel a mix point link that's coming up or going shift and exit will cancel it for you so what do you think the other use of this is i call this I need the toilet mode because yeah it can line up stuff so that it all sounds good but ultimately if you want the next track to start playing and you are like I can't wait five minutes I really need to get to the toilet you can just quickly say look start this track playing when it reaches that cue point bang leave the faders up and leg it off and then by the time you get back you've had 10 minutes instead of five minutes uh, and uh, you've managed to to do what you've got to do so yeah however you use it creatively for having tighter to beat mixes or just for automating the next mix it's made easier on the Flex 10 because we have these nice parallel waveforms and because we have the actual mix point link controls at the top, which don't appear on most uh, DJ gear. So just like when you buy a new camera or something like that, there are settings that you can kind of set and forget so it works the way you want it to work. It's the same with the Flex 10. There are settings in here for Rekordbox and for Serato and also on the unit itself. And I'm going to show you all of them now. So in Rekordbox, you're going to go to the cog at the top and you're going to go to controller and then to deck and then on the flex 10 there's a few things we can change here the jog ring brightness this decides how bright the ring around the jog wheel is here we can have whether the active part in other words whether the drums vocals or instruments shows on the jog wheel it's utterly unclear from what's written here what this does but if you have this one set and let's say you have the vocal part set which is the green color then it will be green. If you then put another one on, it will mix the two colors. On this one here, they'll just go white. I mean, this is really highly, highly uh, technical stuff. And basically, have this ticks if you want the ring around your jog wheel to show the color of the drums, vocals, or instruments that you've chosen to play to remind you that that's how it's set. Likewise, we can set the overall display brightness of our lights. If we're playing in a dark place, we might want to set this lower. If you're playing outdoors in the sunshine, then you might want to set this higher. In instances where there's only one time shown to you on the unit, this chooses whether it's the time remaining or the time elapsed. We saw that on the waveform display. Slip mode is really difficult if you leave it on and don't know you've left it on to figure out what's going on. So you can have things flashing to show you that slip mode is on. So that's a good one to leave enabled. And then this one here is the same for the LED button, the slip mode LED button to keep that light on when slip mode is on or blinking now again it's probably best to leave it set there just to be clear that it's on when you're looking at the unit moving along on the mixer tab 
You can set the crossfader curve here, whether you want it to be smooth crossfader or a switch, depending upon your mixing style. We looked at fader start. If you don't want to use fader start and you think you might use it by accident, you can turn it off here. If you're a scratch DJ, you can alter the cut lag of the crossfader. In other words, how far it has to move for something to happen here. We looked at the talk over control on the microphone. This decides whether when you're talking into the microphone, it only removes the frequencies from the music you're talking over around the mid range, which is where your voice is, or dims the whole track. And you can also have a talk over level here. You just want to, want to experiment with this. If you've used mono split on mixes in the past, you'll be pleased to know you've got this here. It'll put one piece of audio through your left and one through your right, dividing up the master and the cued level, which is what you get on most mixes. Generally not on controllers, but it's here on your Flex 10 in software here. And this brightness here is for the small LED screen on the effects. And the rest of the controls that we can set here are on the Flex 10 tab. So we've got the master output level here. Master output can be set to mono or stereo here. Again, we've got the same controls for the booth output. There's a peak limiter, which stops you distorting by driving too hard here. Uh, the same microphone output master here. And you can set the same thing for the microphone output to both the master and the booth speakers here. To save your ears, should there be a really loud noise sent down the microphone. Speaking of which, when you hit the record button in Rekordbox, you can choose whether you want the microphone on or off there. And the flashing demo mode where everything goes crazy on the controller uh, can be turned off there, or you can decide how long it takes before it comes on. Finally, auto standby. Uh, auto standby will put the unit into sleep after a certain while if you don't use it and then to wake it up again you go to the wake up control here by holding down shift and pressing quantize on the left channel it doesn't work on the right channel so do it on the left one so with record box it's all in the software which keeps it nice and simple with serato it isn't so right at the very beginning of this tutorial when i showed you the download page to get the drivers and firmware you can download the utility i'm going to show you now it's called the ddj flex 10 settings utility and this is where you'll find the settings that you can alter in Serato. So it says here, Recordbox, when using Recordbox, configure the settings from the Recordbox preferences, which is what we just did. But on our drop down here, if I select Serato, you'll see we have things here. Not quite as many, but we do have some of the more important ones. So for instance, we can decide whether the slip mode flashes or not in Serato and the slip button, we saw that one, of course. Fader start, we can turn that on and off. And we can also turn on sync on the decks when the fader start begins here. Uh, jog ring color, we get to select the jog ring modes there. And again, we've got the time elapsed and remaining there. So you can decide whether the virtual deck displays that hot cue indicator that we saw that you can turn on and off entirely with the double tap of the shift button here. And this record output decides whether we get the microphone or not when we're recording. So at least you get some of the more important ones there for Serato. Now there is another place where you can change these settings and that's on the unit itself when it's unplugged. And there is one setting at least in here that I haven't seen anywhere else. So if you're a Serato user, you're definitely gonna to wanna to look at these because there's a lot more here than in the settings utility. But even if you use Recordbox, uh, it might be worth having a little look in here because this one setting in here, as I say, you might like. So we go to the unit itself, make sure it's unplugged from the computer, hold down the back button on the left-hand deck and then the central display gives us this display here. And then using the knob at the top here and pressing down on the knob to go into and come back on the menu, uh, we can change some of these things. Right, so let's look at what we've got. We've got auto standby, we can turn that on or off there. We can change how the demo mode behaves. We can change the microphone talk over. We've seen most of these already, so you've got your level and your advanced there. So this is an interesting one because we can set the headphones to be mono split. We've seen that before, but then you can decide whether the mono split is on the left and right or the right and left, depending on how you like them set. So you could have the master coming out of whichever ear, ear cup you like on your headphones. So the microphone to the booth on or off here. Again, this wasn't on the other utility we saw. You could decide whether the limiter was on it, but you couldn't decide if it was on or off. There is the limiter for both the booth and the master. The master attenuation or volume, the master output stereo or mono, the master limiter, we've seen that. The booth attenuation, the booth output, booth output stereo monitor, and here's our brightness displays as well for all the different areas. Uh, the crossfader cut lag setting there. And if you get all of this totally messed up and you just want to set it back to normal, then you can do it from there. This is an awesome unit, right? And I've just given you a full tutorial on everything it does. I do hope you've enjoyed it. But as I said at the beginning, this is not enough on its own. It's not the full picture if you wanna to learn to DJ. 
If you were just looking for Flex 10 info, you've now got everything you need. You can decide if it's for you. You can get excited if you've ordered one, or if you're looking at one now, scratching your head, you can get up and running fast. All I'd really add is that you do need to understand the software to make the most of a controller like this. We've got popular record box and Serato courses to help with that linked below. But of course, being able to play great DJ sets involves more than that. As well as mastering your gear and your software, you've got to understand the music, including how to assemble and organize and learn a music collection. You need to figure out how to perform the techniques of DJing, how to mix, what to do on the gear in order to keep your sets flowing smoothly. And you need to be able to actually perform in public so you can play live streams, spin at parties, make mixtapes and all that stuff, whatever it is you want to do. And you also need to know how to share your work and how to get noticed, right? It's only when you're learning the right areas properly that you really start to progress in this hobby. We call it our proven five step formula for DJing success. It's in the book. It's how we teach here at Digital DJ Tips. Now to get your free copy of this book where I go into detail about this, you can do that by joining Digital DJ Tips, which is free. There's a link below and we'll let you have this by return. And when you're ready, I'll be thrilled to accept you onto our complete DJ course where I will teach you everything you need to know in those five areas. It works for all DJ gear, including this wonderful controller. Again, there's a link underneath for the course. I'll see you there. Meanwhile, get good, get out there and make the moments.